touching on the Old Testament to reinforce some of these truths, which I want to do again uh, this morning. And uh, I'm going to be speaking. And the nice thing about going through uh, a certain book uh, is that you don't just have to preach on your favorite topics, but we can minister on the Word of God as it stands over there, because if certain topics were not necessary, be they popular or unpopular, they would not be put there by the Holy Spirit. And so I want to touch on a very, very important uh, topic this morning, marriage. And uh, it's one of my favorite uh, topics, and uh, the message that I'm going to share this morning, I often share similar to this at weddings, uh, when I do weddings every now and again. But uh, do turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 24, and then I also want to read from Ephesians 5, uh, verses 22 to 33. Indeed, as we do a careful study on this, um, we will see that a lot of what is said in Ephesians 5, and indeed the New Testament, actually comes from the Old Testament, which was their Bible at that time. We must remember the New Testament was not in existence uh, at that point. And, uh, but let us go to the word of the Lord, Genesis 2. This was after God had created the world and created man. And put him in the garden. And verse 15 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded or commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper. In fact, the old text says a help meet, comparable to him. Maybe you just want to take note of that. I will make him a helper or a help meet, comparable to him or suitable to him. Verse 19 says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Let us go to Ephesians 5 and a few verses there also from verses 22. Wives, submit unto your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, and he is saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Note that it does not say to husbands, to your own husband. Not to men, but to your own husband. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes 
and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Verse 30 says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. May the Lord bless his word to us this morning. Once again, a warm welcome if you're joining us on the podcast. If you could not be here due to a work or some other thing that is preventing you, we just pray that you'd be blessed. Or if you're far away, then uh, be blessed as you join us this morning. Uh, I think this is such a vital area uh, in our lives. Um, And this morning is not intended to be a marriage course. We simply don't have time for that. We do do marriage courses and premarital courses uh, every now and again. But uh, what I want to do this morning is just focus on the blueprint, if you like, the design of marriage. And we've been speaking about walking worthy, having a vision for the church, uh, which Christ indeed is building his church, he established and is still today building his church, and we are very, very much part of that. Now, the marriage relationship forms the pillars of the church, and not only the church, but of society as a whole. Therefore, we see an attack against marriages, uh, broadly speaking, in society and even in the church. And um, just by way of introduction, uh, there's, there's bad news and there's good news. And the good news is better than the bad news. But um, statistics tell us that some 40% of marriages end before 10 years, for the 10-year mark in South Africa. Um, and not only so, some places around the world it's even higher. Um, the main cause or the number one cause of divorce is infidelity or unfaithfulness. Um, but the good news is, and this is an interesting fact, by studies done both by non-Christians, bodies who do statistics on marriage, and people like Focus on the Family, um, they have proved and seen that committed Christians, listen carefully, committed Christians who faithfully attend church are far less likely to become divorced than non-Christians, number one, and even nominal Christians. So where there's nominal Christians, those who go by the name of Christ, or Christian, but don't really serve the Lord, are not really committed, the statistics for divorce are high and the same as unbelievers, but where there is commitment, and various studies show this and prove it, and that's very encouraging, and should be an encouragement to us as Christians, believers, that where there is commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his body, uh, it correlates directly with much, much lower divorce rates. So I want to have a look at this all-important subject this morning. Now, I do realize that sometimes we come from different backgrounds. Uh, sometimes people can be divorced and then get saved. Okay? And uh, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. And there's hope in this, me- uh, this message. Um, for those who are married, uh, the aim, as was the aim of the Word, is to be reminded of these things and to strengthen our marriages, to help in areas of conflict, that we can grow stronger in this vital relationship uh, with each other. So the marriage relationship, and as I've been having a look at the design of the church, as Jesus has designed it, I want to look, and as we go through Ephesians, we'll see that the word hones in more and more and gets more personal as we go along. It comes to children as well, and next week I want to be speaking on children 
uh, also because the word speaks about that in a very, very important area as well. But I want to share uh, a few key areas this morning uh, from Genesis, and I've given some key words here to make it easier for us to remember. So I briefly want to touch on this morning choices, companionship number two, concept or the idea, God's idea or plan or vision for marriage, concept, a comparable, the word speaks about a helper, comparable or suitable for him, to cherish, uh, the word says Jesus loves and cherishes and we ought to do the same to our wives. I want to speak, touch on conflict and then cornerstone. So, seven C's this morning to help us just to touch on a few things. Now, first of all, choices. We see in the garden that God created man and woman as free moral agents with a choice. In fact, even when Adam gave names to the animals, God did not tell him what names to give. That's very important. It, it says whatever Adam, as a separate being, <laughs> made in the image of God, named them, uh, that was their name. Uh, otherwise, we would just be some sort of clone or robot. We would not have the identity in the image of God, that who God has created us to be. So God gave man choices, and the first thing, or the truth I want to present here in terms of our marriage, he in the garden set forth many, many different trees and herbs and different animals, and instead of all the trees, of all the herbs and everything you may eat, but there's one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil that you may not eat. And God didn't force the man or the woman not to eat it, but he did state that if you eat it, there's going to be a consequence. The day that you'll eat it, you'll surely die. There will, you will not now live forever, but you'll die. Now, we know the redemption story later on, but I'm not going to go into that. But nevertheless, man and the woman were banished from the garden and that's the point I want to make, and often I do to young couples. There are many, many blessings of God that He has given us in life. Let us not choose the one bad thing. You know, sometimes the devil will make out that everything is terrible and everything is bad and everything is hopeless. No. Now God has given us much to be thankful for. He has given us the grace of life. He has given us families of children, health, uh, provision. There are so many things, the opportunity to share life eternal. But sometimes the devil will highlight and make the one bad thing. It can be the adulterous thing. It can be whatever to make it look like that's a good thing to eat. And it's not because there will be a consequence. So let us in our marriages be careful and to choose to live life wisely, enjoying the blessings of God, and to overcome. Secondly, we see this morning is companionship. The Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. Uh, we are made to relate to one another. Now, I know that there are some people, like Paul the Apostle, and there are some today, we have the gift of celibacy, uh, but the majority of people, and but yet those people are in fellowship. They're not alone. Uh, but nevertheless, man is not created to be alone. He is formed for companionship, and it's very, very important. And in this companionship, uh, as Jesus said, uh, it's important to recognize it says that Jesus, the husband, needs to love the wife, and he died for the people of God, for the church, explaining how the husband ought to love the wife, to sanctify her, to set her apart, to, to cleanse her. Now, we need to remember in this point is that in companionship, it's very, very important that we are faithful to our companion. 
And as I said, I quoted the number one reason for divorce in the church, outside the church, is adultery or unfaithfulness, infidelity, in other words. Uh, we need to share dreams together. We need to share a vision together, and I'll come on to that in a moment. And we need to be able to communicate with one another. And when we have a companion, we are able to talk, we're able to communicate. And beware lest the enemy robs us of communication with one another. Uh, I know there's value in social media, WhatsApps or whatever, uh, but that should never take the place of face-to-face, heart-to-heart communication. It's interesting, sometimes you even see, you can be sitting in a restaurant and you'll see a couple on their phones, uh, you know, doing what, I don't know. Uh, but be careful, the enemy will try and rob you of communication. We need to speak. We need to talk things out. We need to communicate with one another and we are exclusive, we are holy to one another. We are separated from our old life, separated from our mother and father, and from our old life. I'm not saying you don't see your parents, don't get me wrong. But we are now separated, we are holy to one another. And that is faithfulness, companionship. Thirdly, I want to share is concept. The original text says, says uh, help meet, but the question arises here, to help meet what? What was the woman created uh, as a helper to the man for what end? And the important thing I want to make here is that God has a vision for your marriage. God has a vision for your family. Uh, Peter says, in 1 Peter 3, 7, he says that your heirs together of life, of the grace of the gift of life. So God has a wonderful purpose, and he has a blessing. And just like everything else, you know, much is said about vision these days. Um, unfortunately, it has to do many times with a material thing. But we need to have vision for our family. Um, I know when I first met Jocelyn, and she said to me, don't use me as an example, but uh, <laughs> I can only use her as an example because she's my only wife. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And, uh, but we discussed um, uh, what our vision was, uh, how we see things. And so God has a vision for us. We need to, we are heirs together of life. We need to pray together for God's purposes for our family, for our marriage. God has an absolute purpose and a vision for you and your wife. You need to understand that. We don't just exist and walk along. And I think that's not a good state to be in. If we've lost our vision, if we've lost that vibrancy of the call of God, and we need to call upon Lord, and we need to seek His face and say, Lord, what is your purpose? What is your vision? Because you have joined us together. Have a dream for your family. Pray together, plan together, work towards your dream. Sow into worthy things and you will reap a good reward. Comparable. I will make a helper suitable or comparable to him. And that's very, very important for young people and all people. Uh, Paul at another place in Corinthians, he says, Do not be unequally yoked. Uh, we see in the story of Abraham that God sent Eliezer, his chief servant, he sent him to a faraway land to go and choose because there was relatively few people of God at the time. He sent them to go find a woman of God's people. Abraham knew he did not want his son, Isaac, to be married to an unbeliever. Okay, we see the same with Jacob when Jacob's mother uh, okay, uh, sent Jacob away to his family, uh, unlike the brother Esau who had taken unbelieving wives, wives of the ungodly of the land. Uh, his mother did not want that for Jacob and sent him away, and we know that Jacob later married Leah and Rachel. Uh, so that was Rebecca. So that's very, very important for us. Now that doesn't mean 
uh, that, that we are likewise in personality. In fact, you'll see very often in a marriage couple, there are opposites. There can be an extrovert, there can be an introvert, and sometimes we're looking for exactly the same person, but that's, that's not what the Bible is saying. It's saying don't not be unequally yoked in terms of your vision, in terms of your values, in terms of your faith. That's what it's speaking about because there's problems down the line if you do. I remember there was one young lady who wanted to go out with me before I met Jocelyn. And, uh, but the Lord actually warned me about it. So I got the good one, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and the way God spoke to me one night was that um, uh, I, was, I, I, I always made my bed in the morning. In those days, I used to get up very early. Like I even used to catch a train sometimes from my mums and Toti to Durban and get up like Opa Swarp, have a little quiet time and then go. The train journey was about an hour as well and starting work at seven and so forth. And, uh, but I didn't that particular morning make my bed. <laughs> and uh, came evening, I got home too tired and I got into the bed and fell asleep. And late at night, it was about 12 o'clock, I don't know if you've ever felt where the sheet is all rolled up and it's uncomfortable and I was tossing and turning and so much that it woke me up. And at that point, the Lord said to me, if you make your bed, you're going to lay in it. <laughs> and I've seen it, and I just knew it was related to this particular person that was not, who had different values. Uh, yes, sometimes I'll come to church with you. They'll even go through the waters of baptism. <laughs> but you need to know. You need to make it a matter of earnest prayer. Uh, it might look good at the start. It might even seem to be good, but man, there can be so much pain later on. And I've, I've had the opportunity to counsel uh, a number of young couples, and sometimes, unfortunately, they fail to take that advice only to come back later where there's a divorce or terrible pain. And sadly, um, yes, it can be rectified, but it will always be there. God doesn't want us for that. Uh, comparable, suitable, that's very, very important. Not of unbelievers, that's very, very important. Cherish, to cherish. Uh, just speaking of comparable, I remember once when uh, Jocelyn and I were first going out that we were discussing our spiritual goals. Okay, and what values we had because, or, or have, because that's very important. And we found that we did have the same values and shared the same spiritual goals, and that's important. That's important for us. Cherish. Cherish, and I want to touch on, yeah, on love and respect. Uh, just in a nutshell, the word encourages the wife or the, 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 the woman to respect the husband, to revere the husband, that's the original word there. It means to submit to, uh, to honor, uh, okay, and actually obey. That's what it means. I know in modern society where there's this constant uh, push to redefine the role of women and men, but if we're having a look at the blueprint, it says wives are to submit to their own husband in all things. In fact, in another place, Paul says you're not your own. Uh, you're now one. Your bodies are not your own. Uh, but you actually own one another. And we are to submit in all things. So very prominent in the scripture is the idea of the wife submitting to the husband. And I know that's not very popular but that's why the divorce rate is sometimes so high, because we have failed to follow the blueprint of the Bible. But on the other hand, uh, the word is very strong on husbands loving their wives. Husbands love your wives. So we can see now men and women are created equal. Make no mistake. Your heirs together of life. But the roles are different. The roles are different. In fact, I firmly believe and have come across 
godly women, uh, women who fear the Lord and are, are Christians, do not want to be a man. They don't want to be, they're not, they're not wired for that. <laughs> the idea of gender transitions and all this utter rubbish that we are seeing, this anti-God, anti-Christ stuff that is so prevalent, uh, the whole makeup of a lady and a man psychologically, uh, physically, is just very, very different. Okay, women are not meant to be men and men are not meant to be women. And that is clear from God's design. And if anyone is unhappy with that, so be it. I don't care. The day the government or anyone else tells me I must do that, and I've had people wanting me, and I'll just say no. Okay? I don't care what you do, no. And we are to be the salt and light. Let's not just accept any uh, uh, rubbish that this world or Satan would try and dish up and coerce us to be. Uh, let's just say the Bible says this. God says this and, and encourage him to follow the ways of the Lord, not in a sense of hate, but a sense of, of telling them the truth. Love and respect. It's notable that God took one of Adam's ribs. He didn't take a bone from the foot. The woman is not meant to be trampled underfoot. And sadly, we see that many times as well. But... And that just speaks, it's a bone from close to his heart. And the wife is to be close to the heart of man. Just like Christ loves the church and cherishes the church and protects the church and provides and so forth. So wives are to respect or revere and submit to their own husbands as head of the home. Husbands are the spiritual head of the home. Okay, the wife manages the home. It's not a 50-50 relationship. It's 100%, 100%. We both need to give our all to strengthen our marriage and to have a strong marriage. Uh, I wanted to say something now, but I might remember it in a moment. So I've said that already. Men and women are equal, but their roles are different. And meant to complement one another and not compete with each other. Husbands are to love their wives even as Christ loves the church. And here's an interesting thing. You're bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The New Testament says you are one flesh. You're not your own. And this is the thing that I see husbands and wives many times. I mean, I've come across it just recently where a husband is texting me about the wife and I didn't have a clue who it was. I'm just getting these <laughs> Facebook messages and WhatsApp. And when I discovered who it was, I said, listen, I'm open to counseling. I'll sit with you both. But I'm not just prepared to accept a whole lot of stuff about your wife. Or, uh, and the point I want to make here, and I've come across it many times, where the one thinks that they can take down the other one. But the problem is when you take down the other one, you actually take down yourself. So if the husband tries to take down the wife or malign the wife, or the wife tries to do that to the husband, guess what? You just take down yourself. Because you are one. That's why the word says, no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and nurtures it. So if I break down my wife, I'm actually breaking down myself. But the opposite is also true in what the Word calls us to do. But if we build one another up, if we, according to the design of God's Word, our marriage is blessed, it flourishes. And if I build up my wife, I'm built up. If she builds me up, she is built up, and so forth. So that's very, very important to cherish, to respect, to love one another. The love word of a year means agape. There's all sorts of, you know, messages I've heard about agape love and eros and filio. And you know, they try to over sort of uh, <laughs> and say things that the word is not really saying. In context, yeah, the word agape actually means sacrificial love because it's speaking about Jesus 
how he sacrificed, how he loves the church, how he sacrificed himself to, to sanctify and to make her holy and to cleanse her, such is the love that the man needs for the wife. It's speaking about a sacrificial love, but it's an interesting word. It means giving your life to build her up to her full potential. Just as Christ died, and as we remember this morning in the emblems of the table, that Jesus died for us, that we can reach our full potential, not cut off from life, not banished from paradise forever, but that there might be a new day, a new season, that we can have life everlasting, and that we can reach our full potential in Him. So agape love, sacrificial love, it means giving our lives to one another that we can reach both reach our full potential. It also speaks of friendship. And that's always a good, uh, uh, you know, when you, not only when you're young, but it's, it's good to be friends with one another. <laughs> if you're married and not friends, that's a problem. Okay, if you have good friends when you're young and you're friends with this person and get to know them, that's a good foundation for marriage. Okay, you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to share your dreams and, uh, and, and find out more about one another. Friendship, that's what it also means. Agape love, sacrificial love. Friendship, it means to be fond of, similarly. It means to have affection for. It means an act of the will and duty. The Bible speaks about that, doesn't it? It says, don't... Don't neglect your duties towards one another. Okay, that's what agape love means, an act of the will. It means duty. There is duty in marriage. I remember Jesus said in the natural when he was in a garden, he said, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, speaking about his crucifixion, which is intense agony and under intense pressure and strength, but he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And that's what it's like in marriage. It's not always easy. And we've got to choose to make it work sometimes. It sometimes can seem very, very difficult to go forward with it. But we need to make it work. And then it also means, maybe you haven't heard this, but agape love actually means kiss. <laughs> Don't be afraid to kiss one another. Kiss the bride and carry on kissing afterwards. It means to kiss. So that, that just gives a, a bit of in-depth view to what agape love means. Um, always have that old joke, and you've probably heard it. It's quite popular, but uh, the old couple... They'd been married for 50 years, and some of the good friends gave them a, a gift. And the old, old couple were a very dear couple, but they fought like cat and dog, the whole marriage. <laughs> and so they said, the friends got together and said, look, we, we're going to sponsor them, and they gave them this voucher to go do some marriage counseling. Anyway, long story short, the once counselor sat and listened to the husband and wife, and, and he came to the conclusion he said, look, there's, there's actually nothing seriously wrong in your marriage. There's just one thing. And he's speaking to the husband. And uh, suddenly he took off his white jacket and he grabbed the woman and he gave her a good long kiss. And he said to the, the man, don't you realize this is all she needs? <laughs> this is all that is missing from your marriage. And the old man scratched his head for a moment and the doctor says, she, oh, she needs us at least three times a week. So he said, well, uh, doctor, can I bring her to you on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? <laughs> I don't know if you catch it, but uh, affection, love, friendship, very, very important. Conflict, second last one. We need to be able to successfully marriage times of conflict. Uh, a missionary woman was approached one day. You now, sometimes missionaries and pastors, etc., can be put on pedestals. Uh, they're not perfect. But she was asked a question and said, Do you and your husband ever fight? 
Do you ever have differences? She said, absolutely. And she answered very wisely, and she said, well, if we never had differences, one of us would not be necessary. <laughs> there will be differences. There will be conflict, and we didn't understand that. Once the honeymoon is over, okay? But before you even get to the honeymoon, I would just want to say, young person, if there's, uh, just be mindful that the young man or the young woman, before you get married, their best foot is forward. <laughs> That's the best version. Once you've tied the knot, okay, so if there's issues cropping up, you need to deal with them. Honestly, openly, it doesn't mean there won't be differences. But we need to be mindful. Right from the very beginning, we see that uh, once Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and gave to Adam after being beguiled by the serpent in the garden, God approached him, approached the man, and said, why did you, you're the head of the home, why did you partake of the fruit? And immediately Adam blamed Eve. And then he blamed God. He said, it's actually the woman that you gave me, who gave me to eat. In marriage, we need to take responsibility, personal responsibility. We can never be healed as long as we're pointing. And in marriage, if we want to heal conflict, we need to point the finger to us and say, Lord, where do I need to change? One thing you'll find in marriage is it's very, very difficult. I don't want to use the word impossible, but it's very improbable to change your spouse. It's not an easy thing. But we can change ourselves. We can pray for one another and ask God to change me and to bring change where change is necessary. But if we're always trying to blame the other one, conflict can never be resolved because in our minds and in our hearts we say, but they're the problem. That one's the problem. And this is a message that many you need to hear, and I encourage you to send it to someone if you know struggles in this area after listening to it. We have to take responsibility before healing can take place and walk in that responsibility. There was conflict with Abraham and Sarah. We know that Sarah accused Abraham uh, of not having a child and, and got her servant uh, basically to have a child through her. And there was ongoing conflict that Abraham had to marriage. And they had to work things out, and they did work things out, and went on to inherit the promises of God, but it's not an easy walk. It was many years and many things they had to walk through until Isaac came along. And so, folks, I just want to be real this morning. It's not always easy, but let us walk through but let us learn and overcome these difficulties. We are different, but let's see our differences as a strength and not as a weakness. The Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't keep scores. Don't keep a black book. Keep a clean slate that your prayers not be hindered. That's what the Bible says. If you've dealt with the issue, don't take your anger to bed. Sort it out. Sort it out. And finally this morning, we've had a look at choices. Make good choices for your marriage, things that are going to build you up. Stay away from things that will that'll threaten and tear your marriage down. Companionship. Have good communication. Be faithful to one another. Uh, totally separated to one another. Separate from others. The, the, remember the vision, the concept of God. That he has a vision, he has a plan, he has a dream for you and your spouse. Comparable, suitable, uh, not unequally yoked. Cherish, love and respect. Conflict, we need to deal successfully with it and manage and walk through times of conflict. It won't always be easy. And finally this morning, cornerstone. Cornerstone is the chief foundation stone on what a uh, upon which a building is built. And we praise God for the house and the youth center that has been built and is nearing completion now. And, but that particular piece of ground, um, I know from before, we've been here now 16 years, and um, in a heavy rain, in fact, one day it rained heavy over here many, many years ago, and there was a huge sinkhole. 
I mean, like a big, big sinkhole from where this water went, I don't know, maybe to some underground river or something. Over then I was, quite, I was quite taken aback when I saw it in the morning. And anyway, we had a whole lot of big concrete sleepers laying around, and I took them and got the garden at the time just to throw all of these things in there and cover it up. Uh, but when we built the house, I said to the builder, I said, listen, uh, even though the architect has put a certain foundation, I want you to put a bigger foundation. I want you to put a thicker foundation and a broader foundation, which he done, because I said, you know, this area is prone to, to sinkholes. And so um, your foundation is very, very important. And that's why Jesus said, and finally this morning, build your house upon the rock. And I just want to say, and, and I know we have bad experiences, and sometimes it's not the one spouse's fault. Sometimes there's infidelity and things like that that take place. But just pray and ask God to help you in the season ahead. Okay, whatever your situation is, he's God of the second chance. But build your house upon the foundation of God's word. So once Jesus had taught all the Beatitudes, he taught about forgiveness, he taught about persecution, uh, he, he taught about uh, loving your enemies, and all of these things, he said at the end, and he gave an example, he said a man who builds on the sand, okay, the, the winds are going to come, uh, adversity is going to come, difficult days will come, but when the house is built on the sand, it washed away, but he said the one who built on the rock is the one who builds on my teachings. And let us not only at the beginning of marriage, but out throughout our lives, build our marriages on the foundation of God's word, just as, and it will stand. It's amazing buildings with good foundations, uh, deep foundations, solid foundations, have been known to stand even through tsunamis. <laughs> they can withstand adverse weather because there's a rock, there's a solid foundation, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying. In another place it says a three-folded cord is not easily broken. Let Jesus always be that vital strand in our marriages. The Lord bless you. I trust that God has reminded you and that you take this away and consider what has been said. Consider the Word of God this morning. Consider the blueprint, God's design for marriage. Don't get taken up into all of the rubbish that we hear out there, but let us be lights. Let us take these truths and help others as well. If you've got a good, strong marriage, that's great. And let us encourage others who have gone astray we're struggling, even those who have gone through a divorce, you can tell them, look, why don't you build next time upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus and just uses it as an opportunity to lead them to Christ. But let's bow our heads this morning. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness. We thank you for your word and for your faithfulness, Father. Father, we thank you for families, Lord, and, and that marriage in a in a far deeper sense, is such a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus and his church. And that just speaks of the precious relationship, the closeness, the love that you have for us and how you want us to love one another also. And so, Father, we pray today, I pray for every marriage represented here this morning, for every marriage represented from each member in this church, from every associate, Father, just lift them up before you. Help us to continue to grow. Father, none of us can say we've arrived. We know it all. We're at that place. And help us to grow stronger and stronger in these principles of your word. And Father, you would not say, and your word has much to say about marriage and divorce and so forth. And Lord, your word would not say it if it was not vitally important for us. And we know that the enemy will attack even Christian homes in this area. And we see it so many times. But Father, thank you that the good news is that as we are faithful to you, as we serve you, you look after our marriages. You bless our families. And we speak that blessing now over each one. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Lord bless you. Thank you so much uh, this morning.
And uh, at this point, I'm going to invite the worship team up, and we're going to close in a song. Maybe I'll just ask Damlin and Moses if you were just help with the offering. If you have brought something, we'd like to give you an opportunity to give.